fight the same battles that we fought. Yeah. So we need to get our act together so yeah. and get ourselves out of the way and build that next movement. And we've got a lot of stuff going in America now. We've just got to sustain it and focus it and make sure it's going to lead to transforming change. We issued a report um, this January on ending child poverty um, in America. We asked their Institute to look at nine programs that we knew worked, and if we invested 100% of those programs, how much poverty the children could be alleviated. Um, and again, it's not an act of God, it's a set of political choices that you and I have to change. Um, and they came back and said, well, if we invested in these nine programs of us, um, we could um, decrease child poverty by 60%. Child poverty for black children, 72%. And I tell you, it is a disgrace after the civil rights movement to have black child be the poorest child in America. With 51.3% of black children being born in poverty in the richest nation on earth. What's the matter with us? You know, how are we going to stop this obscenity? Um, and they also said that we can live the floor of 97% of all of our children if we invested fully in just these nine programs. It would cost us $77 million, which is a bargain. Because it cost us a half trillion dollars every year we let all these children grow up ignorant without health care, without education, dropping out of school. And we've, been, we've issued three major reports over the last 20 years that Bob Solo and MIT and Nobel Laureate Economists did for us, saying we could not afford not to end child poverty. And what is it in this country that would rather keep children poor and hurt us and our productivity? Uh, morale and race. What is it um, that, that this legacy keeps us from doing the right thing um, by our children, by our nation's future? And so I, we lay out in this proposal, in this report, how we would pay for it. We don't have a money problem in America, we have a priorities problem. Um, and we've got to change that. So we Real democracy can look like. 
um, and the richest nation on earth. I'm embarrassed by our country's failure yes. to live up to its values and to live up to its potential. Yes. And I think if we don't invest in our children, we're not going to be able to have mm. any strong future. I and my family were all pack racks, and we all sent each other all kinds of old clippings. And one day I got a clipping from my sister over oh, 10 years ago. And it says that everything you need to know in life from an anonymous clinic it was from, you can learn from Noah's Ark. And I guess I want to just shorten my version by just going to Noah's Ark very quickly. And the first lesson from Noah's Ark is don't miss the boat. The <laughs> <laughs> is going to miss the boat because of what they are not doing in investing in our children. How can a country be strong and be secure if a majority of all of its children in all racial income groups cannot read a computed grade level and a majority of um, all of its children, all races? But then you've got almost over 75% of your Latino children who are increasing part of our population and almost 80% of our black children cannot read or compute at grade level in fourth or eighth grade. And then we know about the dropout rates and the implications of that. What is a child going to do in this mobile, in this globalizing economy and competitive economy? They can't read or write. They're being sent off to that prison pipeline and mass incarceration system. And we've got to break it up. I don't care what it takes for us to break it up. Not long, we've got to break it up. Um, and redirect these children to college and into work. And I often dream about how much it would take, and I'd like to go back to your groups too, and say, how many, you know, we set up a high quality early childhood system for every child. Fort Worth, and we'd put the pieces into place, and we would own the pieces, you know, prenatal care, and then how do you do the first three years of life, and how do you do universal pre K, and the pieces are sort of there, and how do you do full year kindergarten, um, because common core standards were being applied. Um, the children coming into, fifth, into kindergarten is that only 12 states require full day kindergarten. Now, the second people holding children accountable, but we don't apply any means to achieve. And so we got to have go straight through kindergarten. And the early childhood people have to get it together and stop fighting with each other. It's about children, not about us. Yes, right. yes. And they all want the money in the zero to three, and then they just want the four year olds that are going to talk about kindergarten because that's really school. Mm -hmm. These are children, so we've got to have a comprehensive, continual care to get every child ready for school so that they can graduate from high school and go to college and go to work. And think about how many public sector jobs you could create if you had a universal high quality early childhood system. If you had a universal after school system to stop some of learning laws and a universal summer learning system to make sure the children didn't kind of lose that three to four months which accumulated over time. We know what to do. And what we do for our own children is what we ought to be doing for other people's children. We ought to build the kind of strong child population. So we don't have a gender problem, we have a will problem, a voice problem, a will problem, we've got to correct that. And we've made steps that we've got to go to a different level of demand. Unbottomly. So that first, we're going to miss the boat if we don't invest. 74% of the 17 and the 24 year olds can't get into the military because they can't read a computer, have a prior incarceration rate, uh, or um, and, and what kind of military are we going to have? Um, if they, they can't read, they've dropped out of school. Um, and so this is the issue if America is going to be truly secure. It's our children who are going to undo us and our national security. Um, the second lesson from this phenomenon stage was that we're all in the same boat. And we have like these black, Latino, and Native American, our children don't look like us, they sound like us, but that's where our population is going to be a majority. What an opportunity God's given us to be an example for a world that is majority not white and non-rich. And so can America live up to its value systems that really make the dream real? But I think that the opportunity we have as children's advocates is to show, yes, we can. And so everything depends on what we do for all of our children to see whether America is going to have credibility in this changing world. Um, and, and, and be a moral beacon um, rather than a blind. The third lesson which they came is to plan ahead. We're not very good at planning ahead because we don't plan in the beginning. You know, not have such great ends when we get into trouble. We wait until after kids get into trouble. We plan ahead and remember that it wasn't raining when Noah was building the ark. I'm sure they thought he was crazy. Um, I wonder what Noah this crazy man was doing. But, but you have to plan ahead. And this country is not planning ahead every year that's 14.7 million children live in poverty. 
And in California, that translates into, that's more than all of your 34 biggest citizens, uh, cities have in, in population. I mean, it's just very hard to imagine what 14.7 million children is. When you say, but all of your California cities, um, well, your 34 biggest cities, being pulled for children, that's what, that's what this number really means. So we really do have to plan ahead, and that means really investing in and the early things. And we've made great progress. I don't want to sit here and sit quiet because we have come a long way in investing in health care. Allison is here, but 90% of our children have access to Medicaid and the CHIP and other health coverage. But we've got to make sure it works and that it is appropriate. Um, so we've made great, there are a lot of laws on the books, and don't let you tell anybody to tell you that we don't have made, but we have not made progress. Huge numbers of laws on the books. Millions of children have been looking at poverty, tens of millions have. Um, we have invested in more Head Start business and, and, and child care in piecemeal ways, but billions and billions of dollars have been invested, and I'm really proud of the laborious technical scuttle that goes into social change. Um, it's not all about press conferences, it's yeah. about doing the work and letting other people take the credit. Um, you can get an awful lot done, so we need to get ourselves out of the way and build these coalitions around children. But you know, we are going to miss that boat, and we don't plan ahead. And tomorrow's America is right now. And what we're doing and not doing in the California legislature um, on our early childhood bills, on our health care bills, on our jobs bills, and all these others. And so I just want to affirm how important your work is um, because we do have to think ahead. The fourth lesson um, from Noah's Ark is, um, is, is to remember, which is my favorite, because I'm not going to talk much more. I'm going to be able to talk more. Um, um, from, from Nora's Ark is that remember that um, the Ark, the Titanic, remember the Titanic was built by experts. The Nora's Ark was built by ordinary amateurs. And people talk a lot about moving maps these days. And experts are zooming in from the top, texts are moving up from the top. That they're gonna it's ordinary people who build movements. Right. Dr. King didn't start a single movement. It was Joanne Robinson, and people with memory around. She used to be looking for the right players in Montgomery, Alabama, um, to challenge the segregated bus system, which they all hate. Mm -hmm. um, and they ran off these leaves, and, and it was Joanne Robinson, whom you ought to know about, who picked Dr. King as a leader of the movement because he'd been the newest preacher in town and didn't have a lot of baggage. Um, but it was the way of ordinary. I mean, it was the Miss Parks didn't come out of nowhere. She came out of Highland Folk School. Just like we're going to have a whole lot of folk coming out of Bailey Park. And we're going to show up and they're going to be the leaders in this next era in many ways. But it, it is ordinary people of grace who start moving groups out of, out of just a lot of simmering um, resentment of injustice. Um, and I remember we had a meeting down at Haley Park with six generations and we had a debate over Andrew and with that meeting. Um, well, when did the civil rights movement start? And nobody could really agree on when the civil rights movement started. Some people said it started with Montgomery March, but the boycott. And some of us no, it started with the March on Washington. Some of us no, it started with where they, they were all over the lot. And then somebody said it really started with uh, World War II. And World War I, excuse me, and then World War II, when the veterans came back from dying and fighting for our country that they could, for rights they could not enjoy themselves. And so it takes a long, it takes a convergence of lots of things um, to build movement. And it's so important to be ready to help shape that when it comes. And I feel we're in another inflection point um, in this nation. And it's not going to come from the top. It's not going to come out of Washington. It's not coming out of Washington as we see it well enough around Black Lives Matters and around lots of other things that are coming. It's got to come out of you. And it's got to come out of you being righteously angry. Um, and determine that we are really going to end child poverty in this country, that we're going to confront the racism, that we're going to confront our history. And until we confront our history of slavery, mm -hmm. of second class treatment of women and exclusion of all women from the electoral process, of genocide of our Native American brothers and sisters, um, and of exclusion of all non profited men from the electoral process is going to keep these birth defects, going to keep flaring up every half century. And we're going to do another one of those periods. But they are flaring up, and we just need to grab those periods and try to channel them um, 
and concrete things we need to talk about. Look, we're teaching our children our textbooks in history because we still have all these myths about American exceptionalism. I was so proud of a 15-year-old freedom school student who was reading his geography textbook in Texas last month and found that they, had, they were in geography, but they were talking about immigration. And then they had black folk immigrating to America to work on, work on farms. <laughs> shows up and all these things. They are monitoring to keep the old story there. And we've got to begin to monitor and really confront our history. I'm pleased that this is happening on campuses and children really begin to confront um, who our heroes are at Harvard and Yale. And I recommend that everybody read Ebony and Ivy, which is a new book on the Ivy League's birth. And all of the country was built in many ways on slavery. So we're really in our freedom schools now, and we've got to move toward how do we treat all of our children mm. with what they read. 90% of the textbooks are not written for non white children. And white children and all of our children need to know the truth about who we are because you can't cure a disease if you don't diagnose it accurately. And so we're moving into that area in a very big way. So very big thing was we've got to get the truth on the table mm. so that we can begin to cure all of these incredibly difficult things. But then we've got to take that truth and really develop and learn from the strategies of the past. But black and brown and other people have achieved in this country from the bottom up out of their misery and out of their struggles has been the one that had been the means of transforming this nation. And it is really time for the next transforming movement in this country. It's time to end child poverty, and child morbidity, and child suffering. It's time to give children hope, um, and we can do that. And many of you have been planting the seeds for that. And we must keep planting and watering those seeds. Mm. And we're going to be ready with the agenda when that comes. We know what to do. What we have to do is to build the rules and make it happen. Yeah. And I'm so grateful to be here with you in Oakland, the gorgeous mayor. Um, with all of you people working in the venue, just don't get discouraged. But don't let politicians be your leaders. You lead them. You make them all of them. <laughs> And who use their votes and their voice 
and their courage mm. to get on your legislators and to get on those who hurt children. Mm. We can make the biggest dogs move. Mm. And so we need to see ourselves as being strategic fleas and building a massive flea core. And I have seen how the flea core has grown over the years with targeted goals. Flick some of us off, a bunch of us come back. So let's just commit to saying we're going to put our children ahead of ourselves and put yes. our own aspirations. Yes. Because we can't raise our own children without raising and making safe other people's children. We've all right. got to share the same streets, we've all got to share the same communities and the same nation. And so I can't think of a greater privilege to have than to be able to think about transforming America yes. and making its dream real and building on the struggles of the civil rights movements and other movements for freedom. And that's the opportunity we have. And this is another inflection point in our nation. And I just hope we're going to get it together and mm. move into a different stage. It could not be worse in many ways with the disparities of wealth and income inequality, mm. with the illiteracy, the massive illiteracy around mm. children, mm. with the mass incarceration that's before us, with the continuation of black bodies being treated as they were in slavery by our police people who were in charge of trying to protect people. What is it going to take us now to get out here Build that nonviolent movement that's going to transform America and make it fit for every child. And what greater privilege could it be than right. to have the opportunity to do that? So, thank you for what you're doing. Mm -hmm. It's movement time. Get yourself out of the way. Mm -hmm. Come together. Mm -hmm. And let's move this nation to what it has to be. Make sure you